Hey guys, I have a question for you. How do you spread abundance? This year, Joe and I are spreading even more abundance by giving out insights on money, wealth strategies, and resources in our current newsletter, Creating Abundance in 52 Weeks, that we want to share with you for free. So sign up right now as you're listening to this episode on our website at www.abundantculture.co. That's .co slash newsletter, www.abundantculture.co slash newsletter. Don't let delay get in the way of your abundant year. Now, back to the episode. Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast. Where we dissect the mindsets and tactics of the true beast of business. People like Gary V, Grant Cardone, and Warren Buffett. All to create a blueprint to experience life more abundantly. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We're so glad to have you back again this week. Today, we are interviewing a very, very charismatic multifamily investor, but not just any multifamily investor. He also coaches and trains people how to be multifamily investors. But the reason why he's very, very different is because he holds your hand through the process. He's helped clients personally raise capital, provide personal financial statements and proof of funds and all these different type of things. And he's very, very successful. He's not somebody who just, you know, teaches people because he did it like 10 years ago and he blew up 10 years ago and now he just trains people and that's how he makes his money. He's an active investor. He's owned over a thousand units and he teaches his students how to own a thousand units in only about five years. And not only that, but he's building employment housing for Amazon as we speak. So get ready to listen to and learn from our good friend, Charles Dobbins. Hi, Charles, and thank you again for coming on to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We are super excited to have you today because you are an expert in your field in real estate multifamily. Uh, Yes, I am. (laughs) But before we get into all of that, we have to ask you, what is your backstory? How did you get here? How did you get into business? Well, my backstory. Okay. So ever since I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to be in the real estate business. I knew that is where the money was made. And that's, I mean, my heroes were the big real estate developers, owners, operators around my town. And, uh, you know, I guess when I was in college, I was the, I was the doorman at a luxury apartment building in Brookline, Massachusetts. And uh, I mean, I got to see the owner. I got to see the operations of an apartment building, 100 unit apartment building, a uh, class A property. I mean, they had a doorman. I mean, so it must have been nice. Yeah. And uh, and so I thought, man, I saw, as I tell people, I said, I saw the owner come in the fifth of every month. Uh, he'd pull up in his Rolls Royce, get out, count the money, pay the bills, get back in his car, and wouldn't see him for a whole other month. And I thought to myself, I can do that job. <laughs> I, I know I can. Absolutely. So after college, though, I went into the, I took the path of least resistance, which I, I highly recommend against for anybody. Life is, life is not worth living if all you're doing is taking the easy way out. And I went into the insurance business because that was what the family business was. And I did it for you know, about five years and absolutely hated it. Uh, said, I want to go be a lawyer and I wanted to uh, um, uh, get out of it. I swore I'd never get back into it again. And I went to law school and after law school, because I was going nights, so I was still working uh, and I was making so much money in the insurance business, I said, yeah, I, I'm going to stay in the insurance business. And that, let me just give you a little parental advice. You have kids? Do you have kids? Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. Well, let me tell you something. If ever one time one of your kids comes home and tells you they want to be in the insurance business, there's something wrong with that child. Okay. <laughs> that is, there's something wrong. Just right away, you know, you know, drop what you're doing and think like, where have we gone wrong? <laughs> where have we gone wrong? I can just see Jasmine doing that. Wow, oh, wow, have we gone wrong? <laughs> um, but it, it's, it, it was uh, the fallback position. And after I got out of law school, I was like, oh, I'm making a lot of money. I've got to stay in it, you know? And, and uh, I started my own insurance company uh, at that time. And I had, a, you know, by the time I built it up, I had about 35 employees. Wow. And, and yeah, wow, huh? 
sometimes those employees made more money than I did. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I know that. Because everybody thought, oh, well, he's the president of that insurance company. Like, oh, he's got, you know, and it's like, listen, I was killing myself. I was miserable. I was working seven days a week, 12 hour days. I was taking no time off. After seven years, I, I looked at myself and I thought, I can't do this anymore. I'm 40 years old. I can't do this anymore. And so uh, I told my wife, I want out, I want out. She said, what do you want to do? I said, I've always wanted to be in the real estate business. I've always wanted to own apartments. That's all I want to do. She said, well, let's do it. And that was it. We burnt the ships. We you know, sold the company. We took the proceeds from the sale and we started buying apartments. And we, you know, within short order, we owned about $20 million of apartments all over the country. And, uh, you know, people talk, well, I own, you know, I didn't JV or no, no I didn't J JV with anyone, but I didn't. My like partner. One, yeah. I, I, I was never a, J, uh, a um, limited partner is what they, I guess people are using the term. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. For, uh, it's, it's not the right term, but people understand what I mean when I say a limited partner. I was always a syndicator. I put the deals together. I was the, the lead and that's how we ran our business and that's how we acquired like over $20 million of property. And, you know, the thing that happened, you you two are just young bucks. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you probably weren't even around back in 2008, you know, right? Barely. Right? Yeah, barely. <laughs> yeah, barely. <laughs> you, yeah, barely. God, dude. you had to say that, didn't you? You just had to rub it in. <laughs> oh, man, that was, that was evil. That was evil. Well, uh, you know, back then we went through the crash and we saw the good side of real estate. And we saw the bad side of real estate. And, you know, I tell you, you, you got to live through, you got to live through a cycle. Hold on. You got to live through a cycle to understand what's, uh, you know, how, how it all works. So, you know, the market crashes and, uh, you know, we're, I, this is our livelihood. This is all we do is we own and operate multifamily properties. And, uh, you know, so we lost some income, we lost some revenue, we lost uh, you know, the way we we're making our living. And so I, I said, um, you know, that was at the time that we were doing some coaching consulting for one of these gurus out there. And then we separated from him. And then what happened was I had a lot of st friends and students who were in trouble. And they needed some help. And so they call me to represent them as their attorney uh, through the process of foreclosure of their multifamily properties. And I said, I said, sure, I'll, I'll do whatever I can. But really at that point, at that point, the practice of law is essentially reactionary. There's nothing you can do. Everything's decided. You know, you're not going to change the yeah. path. You're just going to hold their hand the whole way through the, the process. But I saw how some of these people were buying their properties. And I was like, what? why would you have bought this thing? This is a dog. And like, oh no, we're going to do this and we're going to change the utilities and we're going to do value adds and all this stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. You can't do that on these properties. And I realized that these gurus out there were teaching these people the wrong way to buy apartments. They never gave you the, the full picture. Uh, and a lot of these students just lost their shirts and that really bothered me. Uh, so I decided at that point, man, you know, the thing to do uh, now is to, the thing to do now is to really help people come up with my own coaching and consulting mentoring program to really help people and, and come up with a solution uh, to protect them like, like, a lawyer, but I couldn't practice law and do this for these people because I'm only licensed in Massachusetts and these people are all over the country. So that's when I came up with the Multifamily Investing Academy. And this is where I've, the last 10 years or so, I've been uh, representing clients for, you know, helping them, teaching them every step of the way. And in the next two months, my program is going to be entirely revamped. I'm very excited about emerging with another attorney who does strictly securities law. And we are going to be the whole entire package for uh, multifamily investors. So, you, you know, you don't need to go anywhere else. You've got two attorneys who are going to be looking over your shoulder every step of the way. So it's going to be really cool. Very cool. Yes, yeah. Sir. Yeah, that sounds extremely cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest things that I don't do is I don't take a cut of my clients' deals or my students' deals. I know there are some gurus out there that always do, and that's why they're like, oh, I have 3,000 units. Yeah, you get a little bit, bit of every client's deal, and that's how, the only way you can make, make your claim that you have that many units. Huh. I can't do it that way ethically and, and still keep my law license because – if my compensation is derived by you doing this deal, how can I be objective and tell you oh, that deal stinks? Or like, hey, yeah, let's do this deal because if I do this deal, I'm going to make a hundred thousand bucks on the on the acquisition fee. It's just it just doesn't uh, it, it's not right. It's just not right. And that's one of the, the distinctions between 
That's when I could say, oh, I'm not like the other guys. <laughs> you can trust me. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the things. So, awesome. So yeah. does being an attorney and a multifamily real estate investor, does does that offer kind of like a leg up on the, the competition out there? Because you, you touched on like, you know, there's a lot of other gurus, but I don't know any other, you know, people who really coach that actually yeah. have a, a degree in law. So does it offer uh, an extra like uh, competitive layer or is it kind of just like, yeah, it's, I mean. Okay, yeah. you want to know the truth, just, uh, just us girls here. Uh, here. Let me tell you something, I'll be totally straight with you. The only thing the law degree does that, that other people don't do or, or have is a level of confidence in just going after it. That's honestly, I, that's the way I feel about it. That's, uh, let me give you a couple of examples. I was teaching in Ohio one time and this woman was sitting in the front row and, and it was a funny story because the woman is sitting in the front row. I'm only speaking for like three hours. I speak for the three hours. 10 years later, I'm walking and I remember this woman because she asked this one particular question. I'm at Mr. Landlord's conference and I'm speaking at Mr. Landlord's conference and I'm walking down the hall and this woman's coming at me. I'm like, hey, did you come to one of my speeches like 10 years ago? She goes, who are you? I said, I said thanks a lot. <laughs> I was a lot younger then. I said, Charles Dobbins. She goes, oh, yeah. I saw you speak. I said, yeah, you, in Ohio. She goes, yeah. I said, you sat in the front row. She goes, yeah, I did. I said, and you asked this question. She goes, how do you remember that? I said, well, because it was 10 years ago. Ask me what I did yesterday, and I can't remember a thing. But 10 <laughs> years ago, I, I got it covered. I got it covered. No problem. So she asked this question. I, uh, she said, I like this property. I've been looking at it. She says, why haven't you made an offer? Well, because it's a big property. I said, yeah, so what? She goes, well, because some company owns the property. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, it's, it's obviously owned by a big company. I can't just pick up the phone and call all those people. And I said, oh, no, no, no. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. I have never. I've bought properties. I've bought you know, $12 million properties. I've negotiated $20 million properties. Every time I worked on a deal, I always dealt with a person, not some big monolithic company. It was always a person. You just have to realize that this is just two people talking, trying to figure out a, a deal for a person. And it takes a level of confidence to be able to do that. And people who don't have this law degree think, oh, I can't do it. The law degree just gives you confidence. And let me give you another example. And this one is, is a perfect one. It just happened last night. So I sold off. I've got two more complexes to sell off of my portfolio. And then I'm, I'm, what I'm doing now is... You know, I'm consolidating my life up in Southern New Hampshire. That's where I was born and raised. And so I want to start, you know, I was going to look to invest in Southern New Hampshire, buy apartments in Southern New Hampshire. New Hampshire, you can't buy anything. The demand and the, the, the supply, the supply is non-existent. The demand is so high. The golf course that I, the public golf course that I learned how to play golf in, 36 holes, this is its last year because the owners just sold out to Amazon and they're putting in a distribution center. And 5,000 employers are coming in and there's no place for them to live. So I thought to myself, I got to start building. Yeah. I need to start building apartments. Well, guess what, Jasmine? I don't know anything about building apartments. I don't know the first thing, but boy, I, that's not going to stop me because it was a time I didn't know anything about apartments. Now I'm the expert. Now nobody understands apartments better than I do. And now I look at the same thing here with, um, with, with building apartments. And so you know what I did? Last night, I went to a planning board meeting and I presented a plot of land that I want to build workforce housing on in Southern New Hampshire in this little town. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but nobody was going to stop me. And I'm a lawyer. That gives me the confidence to be able to walk right in there and say, I'm doing it. I don't know anything more than you do. You could have done it for crying out loud, but you think, oh, I can't do it. You know, like, well, the, having a lot of you just gives you more confidence. That's it. And you know what I'm going to do after my second deal when I finally built two, two apartments? Do you know what I'm going to do then? What? I'm going to become the apartmentbuildingguru.com. <laughs> I'm going to teach people how to do it. Because I have the confidence to know I, I know how to do this. So yeah. that's how it's done. You just need to get, listen, I, I just, for some reason, I saw this meme going around Facebook or the internet and it said, uh, you, nothing grows in your comfort zone. Absolutely. I saw, and I, like, I saw like three or four times in different things. I think somebody's trying to teach me something. And that's exactly right. 
Nothing grows in your comfort zone. You got to get out of your comfort zone to make something happen. Absolutely. If you stay in your com- if you stay in your comfort zone, you're going to get the exact same result you've been getting for years. So go out there and fail. Don't be afraid to fail. I've failed many times. I love failing. If somebody comes to me and they don't have a failure under their belt, I'm not interested. I want to hear wow. what you do. And that's, that's really awesome. excellent because I've heard at least I think about two other investors say the exact same thing and they were like pretty experienced guys i don't think they own yeah. the units as you but they were pretty experienced and they were like yeah i don't i don't partner with people who haven't screwed up because yeah, yeah. or you know the new the other terminology that we're here is you know if you haven't been through this through a cycle then you don't know what business you're in and you know when i first heard that what do you mean by a cycle it's oh through a crash you're like well i've been through three of them <laughs> and you know yeah so i know what it's like and i know how volatile this business can be uh, but man, I tell you, I love this business. It's just so much fun. It's just the way life should be. I mean, if you guys, you guys think about it, what you can do for your kids. I mean, the guy, the guy, this land that I'm looking at is owned by a family. The father died many years ago, but these kids are set for life because of what the father did in the real estate business. I like, I always tell a story about Dobbins Egg Farm. And for those of you listening, remember my last name was Dobbins. So this was Dobbins Egg Farm owned by the, a, a relative of ours up in Nashville, New Hampshire. And John Dobbins, all, you know, was the son of the owner of the, of the egg farm. And uh, John Dobbins didn't want to be an egg farmer. John Dobbins wanted to own real estate. So, you know, here's this tale of two Dobbins is my father who was in, in the insurance business for 57 years with New York Life and John Dobbins who uh, decided he wanted, didn't want to be an egg farmer and bought a book on how to turn $1,000 into a million dollars in three years in real estate. And he took, took that book because I know because I went into his office and I said, John, I want to do what you're doing. He says, why don't you? I said, oh, I just got married. We're having kids. I got a new mortgage. I'm trying to make it in the insurance business. He goes here, he pulls out that book and he hands it to me. And he says, go read this book. I know it's a little dated, but do everything it says and you'll have the same lifestyle I have. And I went home and I took that book and you know what I did with it, yeah. don't you? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yo, what did I do with it? Oh, I, well, in the short term, you probably didn't do anything with it. <laughs> yeah, with the, uh, unfortunately, in my case, the short term turned into, turned into 10 years. You know, I put that thing on my, on the, right in the, on the bookcase and I did nothing with it. And, uh, but John Dobbins, when he died, he left his kids millions. They all have trusts. They all work hard. They're all great, great people. Uh, but they are set for life because of the egg farmer reading that book. 30 years ago, 40 years ago. My father, when he died, his business block of business that he that he built up with New York Life, my sister, my brother, and I get a check every single month off the off the renewals and and you know uh, from his his business. Do you know how much my check was last month? How much? How much? Fifty-seven dollars. John Dobbins' kids are millionaires. Where do you want your kids to be? Uh with the John Dobbins family. <laughs> <laughs> It was, Jasmine, Jasmine, it was kind of a rhetorical question, but I, I mean, let's give him the credit. Let's give him the, let's give him the, the, the points for that, for, the answer, for that answer. He got it right. He got it right. That was the right one. Yeah. But I'm telling you, it's, it's just, uh, you, you just get out of your comfort zone, fall flat on your face. Don't be embarrassed to fall flat on your face. It's fun because you, you'll do it five times and then you'll be an expert and you'll know the business better than anyone else. Yeah. It's great. I love it. I love it. So what are some of the things? You still have more that... questions? I, I, I thought, I, haven't I given you enough already? You want more from me? Okay, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, <laughs> you started it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so out of all the things you were like seeing from these other gurus and their students, what are some of the things that, um, and you don't have to say any names, but what are some of the things that you saw a lot of people were doing wrong, especially in the multifamily space of real estate that was, was causing them to like, you know, when they went through this crisis, you know, a lot of people got wiped out. What are some yeah. of the things that they did wrong in that? You know, I got to tell you, if anyone that tries to sell you on this business being a get rich quick scheme, just keep your money in your pocket. Don't, don't, don't do anything with that person. Multifamily is not a get rich quick scheme. I, I mean, you talk about, let's kind of go through the prog- progression of a typical investor. They, they kind of want to get in the single family fix and flips and they, cause they watched everything on TV and they see all these people making, you know, $40,000, but they don't realize all the stuff that goes in behind it. And it's yeah. a lot of work and you got to build a business. I'm going to come back to that expression in just a moment. And you know, when they sell that house, 
it's like when I was in the insurance business, one of the reasons why I hated the insurance business, I'd come in into, you know, my w- w- working with my dad and I'd hey dad, I made a big commission. I made a thousand dollar commission today. He goes, yeah, what are you going to do, do tomorrow? I'm like, okay, could I kind of have like a little pat on the back for just even do that 1000? Like, no, you're only as good as your last sale. That's the same thing is true with the, the fix and flip things. And that's why people in the fix and flip world want to get into the multifamily world because it now talks about cash flow. Multifamily is not real estate. It's cash flow. That's what we're buying. That's what we're trading in. That's what you need to understand. But the fact is that in order to get there, you don't do it overnight. You don't like I teach people how to own a thousand apartments in five years. You don't get there by doing one deal. It takes time and building a business. You've got to build the infrastructure. That's what we're doing with this other attorney um, and I were doing a uh, it's called a multifamily war room. And essentially it's the holistic approach towards a turnkey multifamily business, all aspects of the multifamily business, we're going to hand to you on day one and help you build it right from the ground up. Uh, because this is a business. You got to start out slow, make your first sale, then build on top of it. And you know, before you know it, in three years, three years is typically the right period of time that you need to, to build up the reserves and build up the, the cash flow so that you can quit your job and never have to look back. That's you know, awesome. Do you listen to Dave Ramsey? I, I listen to Dave Ramsey. Dave, do you know who Dave Ramsey is? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So he's got that saying, and I always say it wrong. Uh, like, live for five years like no other, so you can live the rest of your life like no other, or some, yeah, something to that. Like that. If you just focus and do this for five years, you'll have a lifestyle like you can't imagine. And that's, he's talking about the multifamily business. He's actually talking about something else, but I'm stealing it for the multifamily business. That's it works. That. Yeah, it does. It works great. I love it. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, So when someone is trying to get to that goal of like the thousand units in five years or whatever, you know, number they want to get to, um, how does that person like get there? Do you recommend that they start off like with the smaller multifamily and then work their way up or just go big or go home right away? You know, everyone's different. And I don't want to say there's only one way to do this business because there isn't. I've had, I had one student uh, that was with me for about two years or so. Great guy, smart guy, CPA. And, you know, after about two years of looking at one to three to $5 million deals, he comes to me and says, Charlie, I've got this $27 million deal I want to do. I'm like, okay, all right, all right, listen, I know how to do it and I'm going to help you every step of the way, but let's think twice about this. This is your first deal. I mean, you're going to do $27 million. Yeah, yeah, Charlie, I know uh, it, it sounds crazy, but I know that it's easier for me to raise private money for the bigger deals than it is for the smaller deals. And I said, well, okay, that is true. That is true. Uh, but $27 million is no, and I've got it all lined up, but I'm going to do it. I said, okay, fine. Let's go for it. So we went for it. And he ended up out of the $27 million, he got a, the bank loan for 65% loan to value leaving him with 35%. The debt lender also gave him 25% of equity. So the debt, the mortgage guy brought equity to the table. He had an investor that they put the two together because that way he gets to make his sale. And then my friend, my student had to raise 5% of the deal uh, to just to make it happen. A $27 million deal. (laughs) And he calls me up like and my job is to help my students get across the finish line so i help them every way i can he calls me up he says charlie i got a week to go and i'm a quarter million dollars short can you help me out i said ah yeah yeah give me information i'll blast it out to my list and sure enough we blasted out the list and and i raised uh, the extra quarter million uh, bucks for him i found people in my group to to kick it in and he closed his first deal for 27 million dollars and you know, yeah, but I have another student that just did their first deal for 15 units. So it really, it depends upon where you are, what's your comfort zone. I always ask the people, my students when, we, when they first come into my program, we sit down and do about an hour long phone conversation. And I said, where do you see yourself in five years? That's what I want to know. 
where are you going to be in five years? Where do you want to be? You know, you guys might be thinking, I want to stay in my hometown. We want to start a family. I want to find deals here. Okay, fine. That's great. That's what we're going to do. We're going to, you can find deals in your backyard. Remember, my heroes back when I was a little kid were people right in my own town of Nashua, New Hampshire. They were multimillionaires. They didn't have to go to Fort Worth, Texas because some guru told them it was an emerging market. They did it right in their backyard. And, and that's anyone can do that. You got to find deals wherever you go. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, sourcing deals, one thing I have trouble wrapping my head around sometimes is that when you're sourcing deals, uh, where well, f- one, where are you sourcing the deals? And then two, the people who have that type of deal flow, how do you, I guess, present yourself to where they trust you enough to present those type of deals? Because with the CPA guy, that, that was his first deal. And I mean, 27 million bucks for your first deal and then getting not only debt, but also the debt person bringing equity to you. That's not, you know, that's an everyday right. thing. So right. it's like, how okay. do you, how do you um, like present yourself to uh, like put yourself in position to receive those type of opportunities? Okay. Well, you've got to find them. You got to get out there. You got to look as I, the first part of my course is, is how to find deals where no one else is looking. Okay. And then the second part of my deal is, is how to speak to brokers because I, the reason why I put that second, uh, second course in there and as, as the second course was I was finding out that several of my students, they were terrified to speak to brokers. They thought that they were, you know, were intimidated. This gets back to, you know, having nothing but confidence as a lawyer that my students were afraid to talk to brokers. And I told them, I said, listen, there's a reason why they're called brokers, because they're broker than you and me. So <laughs> let, they're broke. They're, they, they don't make anything of their uh, thing. Just, you know, and a, a broker is a human roadblock. He's a human rain delay. You got to just go right through them. Like, don't let them get in, get in your way. The, you know, I'll tell you something. My father, God rest his soul, is the greatest man in the world. He didn't discriminate against anybody. One time we're driving down the highway and we're driving by a mobile home park. Remember, it's the insurance business. Driving by the mobile home park, I was about six years old. And he says, you see that mobile home park over there? I said, yeah. He goes, they wrote me a check for $75,000 for an annuity. And I said, wow. He says, just goes to show you, you can never judge a book by its cover. You got to, you just have to treat everybody exactly the same. And I said, "Uh, I've lived that forever. We treat everybody exactly the same. I may treat them all badly, but I treat them all exactly the same. Okay. (laughs) So- the broker's responsibility is, is to create ways to discriminate against you. Okay. Yeah. When a cl- when a broker asks you for a proof of funds letter, biggest waste of, of paper ever proof of funds letter is as useless as a paper it's on. Why does the broker need it? Because he wants to be able to go to the seller and explain why you're better than somebody else, or you're not as good as somebody else, all because of this piece of paper. That is just wrong. So uh, that pisses me off like you can't imagine. And so I tell my students, listen, if you're in that situation, you get me on the phone. You and I are partners in the deal. You get me and we're not really. I'm your partner. I'll walk you through the whole conversation and I will make sure that you get covered today. Um, As a matter of fact, uh, let me just give you an example. Let me see. Uh, Where is he? Where is he? Okay. So so I have a client that uh, he's, he's an accountant. Okay, but young kid, he doesn't, he's never done this before. And uh, he, um, you get a lot of accountants, don't you? Oh, oh, I know. And I love teaching multifamily accounting. It's my most favorite topic. This topic. Uh, listen, I, I, that's one of the things people aren't, you've got to understand a multifamily financial statement. You've got to understand a trailing 12. And most people were like, oh my gosh, I, I can't even balance my own checkbook. I'll never be in the multifamily business. It's so hard. So like not the way I teach it. When you see how I teach multifamily accounting, you will get it. And I have accountants in the, in the room and I said, I'm going to teach you how to understand multifamily accounting better than your accountant. And then when I'm done, you can see all the accountants like, yeah, you get it. You, I'm totally understand. And I explain it in such a, such a good way. And I, I, that's my most, that's my most fun part of my, my, uh, my uh, big training. But anyway, so this guy is a deal and I think it's an $8 million deal. So he is in best and final. Okay. He's never done a deal before in his life. He's out there in the deal. And, and I said, um, 
I said, okay. He said, I, I said, they want to have a conference call with my partners and me so that we can answer questions that they have. And I'm like, okay, fine, fine. Uh, they like, set up the call. Okay, so it's it was like yesterday at nine o'clock. I'm like, okay, fine. Nine o'clock, I'll get on the call. We had a hard time dialing in. I'm like, oh, I got another call coming up. I'm running out of time. And um, I said, who's going to be on this call? And he lists like 15 people. I'm like, oh, for crying out loud. I don't want to talk to 15 other people at nine o'clock in the morning. But I didn't tell him that. So I said, okay, okay, fine. We'll, we'll get on the call. We'll, we'll yeah. talk to the guy. Oh my gosh, we dazzled them, okay? By the time we were done, and so what my client, I love this, he goes, he, and uh, I'm reading this right here, okay? He says, I didn't get a chance to say it yesterday, but thank you so much for being on the call with me yesterday, Charlie. I really appreciate it. And then I read, I see my, was I good? My pleasure, buddy. I was good. And he says, you were excellent. Thanks again. So, you know, my students will do that. They'll call on me to do that first until they get the feel for it and until they build up the confidence to know that they can handle those calls themselves they don't have to be afraid of talking to a broker it's just a roadblock get over so the most important thing you did everything i just said is the discrimination component okay this guy is trying to figure out who you are when you give them a proof of funds letter, whether you're using your own or somebody else's, you are essentially giving them bullets for your gun. You're giving the enemy bullets for their gun against you because they're just going to use it to discriminate against you, whether it's a good discrimination or a bad discrimination. That's the whole point. And we don't, we don't want to deal with that. We don't want to deal with that. So my job is to get my students in the right position so that that's not even, not even an issue. Man. I have never Every... heard it explained yeah. <laughs> that perfectly. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> it is. It is. But listen, it all goes back. I remember when I was driving down the street thinking that pr proof of funds letter is nothing more than a form of discrimination. That's what this guy is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And and he wants to make my client look bad so he can sell it to somebody else. I'm not, not going to let him do that. So that's that's how I look at these things. And it and it's so key what you're saying because I don't know how much you know about us, but we're in we're like kind of in a private equity space and we buy like businesses, small businesses and stuff like that. And I literally just had that problem on a deal. And yeah. usually I like I, I just get find a way to get around it, but it was like this really good deal that I wanted. And then this broker was just being a huge roadblock. So I was yeah. like, okay, I'll, I'll get on a proof of funds. So I actually got a proof of funds from one of my investors for literally half of the purchase price and I gave it to him and no, but I know I'm pretty sure most people didn't come with half the purchase price of the yeah. business in cash. I yeah. gave him the proof of funds. I'm like, yeah, we should be good now. I should get whatever I want because I mean, I'm, but and do we know what happened yet? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so like, he yeah it didn't work it didn't work out long story short very very long story short it did not work out and it was like it was in my mind i was like i've i've gotten deals done without proof of funds before yeah so if i actually gave somebody one i should have an easier time closing a deal yeah and i actually gave him a decent one and i didn't close i wasn't able to close and he actually did exactly what you said he used it to, to discriminate <laughs> exactly and it was yeah. so crazy i was like oh my goodness yeah 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 isn't it it's wild and the thing is you know i taught my students i said listen push back on the broker when he asked for proof of funds you know and you can actually find there's a company on the net you, if you google uh, uh proof of funds letter there's a company that sells them for 250 bucks that's how useless they are i'm not kidding you um but i tell my students okay well what kind of proof of funds well i don't know the bro broker just said if he wants proof of funds well for how much well i don't know i said okay call the broker back and here's what you're gonna ask him do you want a hard proof of funds or soft proof of funds and, and let me tell you, do you know what that means? I don't. I was waiting yeah, on most, you. Most brokers don't either, and they don't want to look stupid. So, they're, oh, you know what? We'll pass over that proof of funds requirement. <laughs> and let's like, and you just push back on these guys. They will cave like a cheap suit. It's unbela unbelievable. And so, cave like, no, they fold like a cheap suit. They cave. I, I get my things mixed up. <laughs> we get it. But, yeah, but yeah, but th those those proof of funds that are, are so absolutely useless. And you know, they ask, well, how much do you want them for? Well, you know, 
hundred percent of the purchase price or 50 or 20 or what, you know, how much do you need? And it's just, they're, they're so ridiculous. And there was, oh, there's one other, it's going to come back to me in a moment. And there's another story that I want to tell you about. Oh, okay. Okay. So listen to this. And I want other people to hear this. I had this one student, every time she sub, uh, submitted an offer and talked to the broker, they'd always come back and want a proof of funds letter. Every different, I'm, I'm like, oh, why? What are you doing wrong? It doesn't work this way. Not every broker should do this. And she goes, I don't know. I don't know. I said, I tell you what, next time we submit an offer, let me call, let me get on the call with you and I'll handle it. They didn't ask me for a proof of funds letter because I sounded like I had confidence because I have a law degree. Oh, what do you know? No, you just have confidence. And, and what she's, afterwards she said, oh my gosh, that was fantastic. I've, I've never spoken to a broker that way. I said, yeah, you know, just don't think that every deal, you, you know, the broker's going to ask for a proof of funds. Just, it's a, that's a roadblock. Run away from it. Don't even deal with it. And what you tell the brokers that, listen, if we go to contract, I'll provide you with my financials. But prior to that, my I don't, and my my uh, investors, my, my partners, we don't give out our personal and financial information to anybody. I don't even know who you are. So absolutely, yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, we'll be stick with me, Jasmine. Stick with me. You know, I'll I'll drag Joe along, kicking and screaming, but I'll get you there. I'll get you there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So you've given us tons of information. Um, we're probably going to have to ask you to come on for a part two one day because. <laughs> This is like a TikTok, right? This is like a TikTok. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I got save for part two. Click for part two. Right. Uh, <laughs> no, I got to tell you, we're in this. For those listening, I don't know when you're listening. We're in this COVID thing, and all my kids are home, and they got me turned on to this TikTok thing, and I love TikTok. <laughs> it's the biggest time waster. And people are like, oh, you can't do TikTok. It's owned by the Chinese government, and they're stealing all your information and all this stuff. I said, let them steal it. TikTok is the biggest time waster. If they go back and have to watch and, 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 and dig for my personal information through TikTok, they'll never overcome us. They'll never control our co country. They'll be so locked in TikTok hell, they can't accomplish anything. Give it to them. Let them have it. Absolutely. <laughs> so what is the number one takeaway you would like somebody to get from this specific podcast episode? Oh boy. Can I do a 1A, 1B, and 1C? Yeah. Okay. We'll get 1A is just get out of your comfort zone. Number uh, part B is this is not a get rich quick scheme. This is a life, lifelong venture. And part C is this is a business and you're going to treat it like a business. And the only way you're going to get to those big numbers and, and live the life like John Dobbins and his children is to create a business that perpetuates money. That's it. That has systems that run, run it. And that's, that's what I do is I teach people how to build the systems. Absolutely. We love Yeah. 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 Love systems. Yes. Yeah, I do too. So you're on the Abundant Culture Podcast, and we feel the need to ask this question for everybody who comes on because we always get very, very unique and cool answers from each uh, guest. And the question is, whether it be in your personal life, your business, or even in your spiritual life, how do you like to spread abundance? Okay. You know, I have four kids. Mic, mic drop. That, that's so abundance right there. <laughs> no. Yeah, and I tell people I have four kids. Three of them I really like, uh, you know, and they're always like, "Dad, who don't you like?" Well, you know, never like, "Oh, it's one of these things." You'll find out when the trust fund opens up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I gotta. I'm gonna use that one next time. So, um, yep. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so okay. My dad greatest man in the world was an orphan and he lived in an orphanage until he was 16 and the state couldn't take care of him anymore so they had to they shipped him off to his alcoholic father and, and he uh i mean he you know moved from franklin new hampshire back down to nashua and uh and he um god love them he became the class president most popular boy of his high school and uh and one day he's walking down the street after graduation and a car full of National High School teachers pulled up to him along with his English teacher and they said, hey, Lenny, what are you doing? Where are you going to college? And he goes, I, don't, I can't go to college. I, I don't have any money. So somebody like you should go to college. So they went and they, they took up, a, passed a hat among all the teachers at Nashville High and they collected $75 of his $100 tuition at Keene State in uh, in New Hampshire, and st they sent my dad to college. I mean, they really gave him a scholarship, you know, and and, and that changed his life, and he, he never forgot that. And so when he was dying uh, in the hospital bed, you know, 
it's just so you know what time most people think hey, this is gonna be a sad story i'm already laughing at it and then the doctor comes in and says sorry lenny there's nothing more we can do you got to make your plans it's only a couple hours left and he was fully coherent and uh he's okay you know first thing he said was oh i just wanted 10 more years the guy was 82 years old he wanted 10 more years because he was having such a blast and uh and so he starts barking out commands he's like tell pay this and do this and then he says and pay this girl's tuition and and my sister and i look at each other like pay what girl's tuition and like we have a sister that we didn't even know about and he goes and he said no no the president of the national ymca they have a daycare there and there's a woman that runs a daycare and she needs in order for her to keep her job she needs a teaching certificate and to get a teaching certificate you need a bachelor's and she's a single mother and she can't afford to do it so mike lachance from the y comes to my dad and says hey lenny will you pay her tuition my dad says yep I'll pay her tuition. So he bet he was paying this girl's tuition. We never even knew. And so uh, my dad, you know, after he died, Mike Lachance comes to me and says, Charlie, you know, are you going to pay it? I say, Mike, all set. My dad said to, to pay the tuition. Oh man, that's so great. So I wrote the check. We paid the tuition. He calls me up the next September and he says, Hey, Charlie, are you going to pay this year's tuition? I was like, well, um, yeah, my dad said this was the last payment. I didn't realize it was another year that I had to go. He was, oh yeah, she's got another year to go. And I said, well, you know, my dad said pay the tuition. He didn't say pay that, you know, the the last sem that third semester. So I'll pay the tuition. So I pay the tuition, but I said, but Mike, this time I'm going to treat her like she's a Dobbins kid. And he goes, oh, okay. Well, what what does that mean? I said, this time I want to see her grades. He goes, oh, Charlie, she's a straight A student. And I said, well, then she ain't no Dobbins kid. That's for damn sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I told. <laughs> I, t I told this story to um, the president of my high school, uh, you know, with the Catholic boys high school. Now it's Catholic boys and girls because my father was on the board of education. And he voted to go co-ed. Thanks, pal. Ten years too late. Anyway, so uh, I told her the story and she says, well, wow, that's really interesting. I'll come uh, talk to you. So she did. She came to me and she said, we're trying to start this program called the Sacred Heart Scholars. That's the name of the brothers of the, of the Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart Scholarship Program where we sent 20 underprivileged kids in, in, from Nashua to the high school and would you be interested in, in, in starting it? And I said, count me in. So I, that's my passion right now. That and building workforce housing because people don't have places to live right now. And I'm not talking about you know low income people. I'm talking about nurses, police, firefighters. They don't have any place to live. So those things keep me going. I'm telling you, I have never been having more fun in my life, make more money than you can imagine. I'm having an absolute blast. I wake up in the morning and I can't wait to start the day. And I, I'm going to be like my father on the deathbed, saying like, I just wanted 20 more years. You know, and that, that's that's what I that's what I want to do. I'm at that stage now, and I'm just. I'm just going full full steam because it's a blast. That's that is amazing. Awesome. You tell yeah. like great stories. Like you got uh, <laughs> story. Yeah. Made them all up, Jasmine. <laughs> Duped another one, folks. Duped another one. So. <laughs> so for the person, they love your stories. They think you're awesome. And maybe they just want to chat with you. I don't know about what, but mm -hmm. um, maybe they want to chat with you. Maybe they want your coaching because they can tell that you have have like the most experience and you really know what you're doing yeah. <laughs> and you can help them um or maybe they want you on their podcast as well how can that yeah. work in, into contact with you or your team you can track me down www.multifamilywarroom.com and that's with my 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 good friend Jillian Sidoti uh, who's a securities attorney I call her the securities attorney that stars and we are now putting our two teams together so that when you come on board, the whole focus will be on helping you build your multifamily business and own property, you know, from, from raising the money to setting up the systems to, to building the business, all aspects of it. That's what we want to do. Amazing. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for coming on to the Abundant Coach sure, Podcast. I've interviewed other multifamily investors, and none of them are characters like you. You're no, really or as good looking as I am. Please, please say that. And tall. And tall. I am tall. So I, uh, I mean, I can't really tell. I can't vouch for that. I don't want to lie. <laughs> about the good looking? About the good looking part? Yeah, you're or good looking. The, uh, the, uh, <laughs> 
forget. <laughs> no, guys, this has been a blast. You guys are you guys are sweethearts. It is so much fun. As you can tell, I'm I'm just absolutely passionate about this business. I love talking about it. I mean, this is we could keep on going, going for another hour. But but yeah, this is this is a lot of fun. I love talking with you. I mean, this is we can help people. We can absolutely help people with what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you so much. Cool. Oh, my pleasure. So that's all we have for today, folks. I hope you got as much value out of this as we did. Keep in mind, the only way we can improve is through constructive feedback. So remember to rate and review this episode. Also, you are not the only person that needs to know this super valuable information. So be sure to subscribe and share as well. Stay tuned for the next episode. And remember to always spread abundance. Peace.